Welcome to the Gray Area Podcast presented by Aura. My name is Kevin Gray, Mavericks pre- and post-game host on the Dallas Mavericks Radio Network. Appreciate you joining me here on the latest episode of the Gray Area. Make sure you download and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast for free. Give it a five-star rating and write a review for it while you're there. You can follow me on Twitter at Kevin Gray Sports. So excited for interview Wednesdays here as we are getting down to it in the NBA regular season, Major League Baseball underway, all kinds of fun stuff going on. But as you know, I'm also a professional wrestling fan. So this is a massive time of the year for me because we've got WrestleMania coming up this weekend. And as I was thinking about who I wanted to talk to about a little bit of basketball, a little bit of pro wrestling, I thought, you know what? I could go talk to my guy, Ty, Tyler Batiste, managing editor of The Athletic, joining me here on the Gray Area Podcast for Interview Wednesdays. Tyler, what's going on? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good, man. Excited to have you on the show. I appreciate uh, it. It's uh, it's an exciting time. We're going to get into a lot today, but for us in particular, we're huge wrestling fans, and this is kind of the Super Bowl. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Of the pro wrestling with WrestleMania, the NXT, you got all kinds of stuff going on. But for those who don't know, how did you come to love the world of professional wrestling? Oh, man, it, it obviously since I was a kid, um, I think a lot of it was a part of um, my dad's brother. Uh, he didn't have kids until he was kind of uh, older in life. And so when we were growing up, it almost seems like he had a little bit of a uh, a night for each of his nieces and nephews and younger cousins that he would just hang out with them and try to visit with them. And our night just kind of happened to be Monday. So uh, my first memories, a lot of it are just kind of watching Raw and Nitro with my uncle and kind of, uh, you know, he was really big in the Stone Cold when I was, you know, 10, 11 years old. And um, obviously I probably was a little bit of a fan before then, but that's like kind of the first memory of of really like, learning to enjoy and appreciate it and you get older you appreciate you know the other stuff that goes into it like the storyline development the writing the athleticism um the fact that there's no off season and you're putting on you know television product and other things 52 weeks a year and and i think it kind of lends itself to kind of what i ended up doing in terms of of being an editor because i love to as much as i love the action in the ring i'm always thinking about the behind the scenes stuff of like how did they write that why did they write it this way why did they put this at the end of the show and instead of at the beginning. And um, so it's just fascinating to me, man. And like you said, it's a, it's Super Bowl week. So this is a pretty exciting time. Yeah. And we'll definitely get into plenty of that because of course you've got Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes and the uh, main event night one and night two Uh, shout out to the rock and Seth Rollins, who of course are a part of this major storyline. It's really been years in the making. So we'll definitely get into plenty of that as the, uh, the show goes on. But you also, as I mentioned, managing editor for the athletic NBA. So not only is it a busy time specifically this week, but just in general, because we're in the final couple of weeks of the NBA regular season headed toward the NBA playoffs, balancing all of this. What is this time of the year like for you, especially with the group of writers that you have and the amount of content that you guys at the athletic are putting out, especially as we get down to the uh, end of the regular season here. I mean, it's fun, right? Like, like you can't, um, I'm consider myself lucky that like, you know, my job involves professional sports and and having to be aware of what's going on in the sport that I, you know, love the most. So um, all things considered, it, it's a, it's a blessing to kind of like know that you, when you wake up and log on for work every day, you're doing something that you actually enjoy. Um, I know a lot of people can't always say that and I'm, I'm glad that I can, but um, yeah, like you said, getting ready for the playoffs and postseason, And then on the heels of that, you got the draft and, and free agency. It's a, it's a it's a tiring time because you're toward the end of kind of that stretch for this past season. But it's an exciting time because you look at the NBA right now. There's so many new faces and new teams that could make some noise uh, coming up over the next couple of months. The Thunder, the Magic are having a really good season out um, out east. You know, you got Minnesota, who's been atop the West for, for a while. So not only is it exciting because of the time of year and the sport, but the opportunity to tell some maybe some stories that we haven't been really been able to dive into over the past couple of years because these teams are are at the forefront now is going to be really, really exciting. So we got some really good stuff, hopefully, in the works over the next few weeks and months. Yeah, there's a lot of terrific storylines as we get toward the end yeah. of the regular season. Nikola Jokic looking for a third NBA MVP. Shea Gilgis-Alexander has turned into a superstar in Oklahoma City. And obviously for 
Mavericks fans, Luka Doncic in the middle of the MVP discussion as well. And obviously you have a pulse on the league as a whole, but being in the DFW area yourself, obviously the conversation centers around Luka and the Mavericks. What have you made of just at times their up and down season and now having, of course, they lost to Golden State on Tuesday, but prior to that, having won seven straight, 11 to 12, and now have climbed up to fifth, you know, in the Western Conference at this point now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because uh, it, it almost seems like a situation like the NHL, right? Like the NHL, a lot of times uh, the best team doesn't always win. It's always the team that gets hot in March and April. Um, so I would imagine that if you're a Mavericks fan, this is the time you would want them to be playing sort of their best basketball as the calendar turns to April. Um, you just kind of hope that 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 valley or that dip that they've experienced so um, so frequently doesn't come in the end of April or May or anything like that. You want them to continue to ride this high. Um, the thing I always say about the Mavericks is, you know, you, you've got a chance when you know every time you step on the court, you're going to have probably the best player and at worst, the second best player. Um, and then Kyrie, depending on how he's playing, you know, you might have number you, you might have number three in a lot of series. So um, if that's your start, starting point to kind of uh, try to win four out of seven games in a playoff series, um, I think you got to like your chances. They could always go on a run like we saw a couple years ago to get to the Western Conference Finals. Of course, you want to be a little bit more consistent. But, um, you know, I think the fact that they're hovering, uh, you know, in the playoffs right now and not trying to fight to get into the play in um, like they were around this time last year is 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 pretty good. And you just kind of hope, regardless of how the playoffs turn out this year, that they can build on this next year as opposed to um, sort of what happened last season where you come off the conference finals run and then, uh, take a step back. And again, you've got Luca, you've got a superstar, um, you've got a borderline superstar um, or a superstar, depending on how you look at Kyrie Irving based on his availability and whatnot. Um, that, that's a good starting point. So it's an exciting time here. Yeah. What's kind of been the um, the national discussion around this team? Because obviously you're not just focused on what's happening with Dallas, but uh, overall with the league as well, given the amount of great players and teams that we've seen throughout the course of the year, what's kind of been the national discussion around this team based on what you've been able to gather? I mean, a lot of people that I've talked to um, throughout the course of the season, it, um, Luke has been probably third in the MVP discussion, you know, I think but behind Jokic and Shea Gilgis Alexander. Um, and I've had conversations with people that, uh, have kind of said, you know, if, if Dallas can maybe get to four or five, maybe you start uh, taking his MVP candidacy a little bit, I don't want to say more seriously, but kind of uh, adding more weight to it because, you know, it's really hard to win an MVP if you're, uh, no matter how good you are, if you're seventh, eighth, or ninth in your conference. I remember Westbrook did it uh, a few years back in, in the Thunder where I believe six is where they finished in the West, but um, that was after averaging a, a triple-double um, over the course of the season. Of course, he had ended up doing it a few more times, so Obviously, the national conversation always centers around Luca. Um, I think the trade that they made, trades that they made, I should say, around uh, the trade deadline to get rid of Grant Williams and bring in PJ Washington and, and Daniel Gafford really showed, sort of uh, showed people that they were number one, eager to or, or willing to make moves. And then number two, that um, obviously the, with the way they played over the past few weeks, that those moves uh, ended up working uh, to, to, to a, a smaller extent. Obviously, we'll see if they work in the playoffs. And um, that whole stress that Daniel Gafford had, man, I was I was I was watching games with friends, you know, at restaurants and bars. And it was amazing. That was like the first time uh, in DFW that I was out watching a game and the people were not completely focused on Luca. It was trying to make sure that that mm. effort had was going to continue. And uh, you, I mean, you saw people cheering at the bar and I was like, man, this is a, <laughs> like this is this is a March game. Like I, I kind of thought that streak was like a. a, a Kind of a small segment of the NBA population was paying attention, but people were talking about it nationally, and of course, people were talking about it here. So, um, yeah, Gafford's a good player, and we'll see if 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 those reinforcements that they brought in in February kind of make their mark um, as we get into April and May. Yeah, and maybe June. I don't want it. Maybe June. I don't know. <laughs> but don't get Mavericks fans excited about that. I, I don't want to leave out. I don't want to leave out June as possible right now. So we'll see. I mean, the Mavericks for I think a lot of people that watch this team have seen this team throughout the course of the year feel like hey that's the proverbial you don't want to see that team you know in the playoffs they have obviously what you mentioned with Luca and Kyrie and the supporting cast starting to you know gel at the right time and I'm just curious because when you watch not just the Mavericks but 
the Thunder and the Timberwolves to a degree, you know, with the Los Angeles Clippers and the Pelicans. I mean, the West has just been a murderer's row this year with the amount of talent and teams that are in the West and how well they've been playing this year. Who is kind of your favorite as you're looking at, you know, the West and obviously with, with Boston and Milwaukee and other teams are doing in the East? Who have kind of separated themselves in your mind as you feel like who are real, the real championship contenders based on what you've seen? Uh, you know, we're both big wrestling fans, and there's a saying that to be the man, you got to beat the man. Yeah. And sure. Denver, Denver hasn't shown me anything. Uh, they're first in the West right now as we're sitting here recording this. I don't think um, as good as Boston has been and historically good in some measures as Boston has been, um, Denver's proven that that they can do it. They did it last year. I think they're – their bench might be a little bit uh, maybe taking a small step back from where they were last year, but they sort of bet on guys like Peyton Watson and Christian Brown, um, Reggie Jackson as well to kind of um, uh, come up and, and step up for like Bruce Brown and Jeff Green and those folks. And um, now we're getting here to the last, you know, 10 days or so of the regular season and they're sitting at the top of the Western conference. And I don't want to say it feels like people aren't talking about them, but like they almost, it feels sort of mundane. It's like, Oh yeah, of course we expect it. Uh, you know, Denver to be here. They won it last year. A lot of talk about Minnesota and Dallas and the Clippers and and, and the Thunder and whatnot. But, you know, like I said, they're the champs. So uh, until somebody goes in, in, into Denver and beats them in the playoffs, like they're they're my favorite. I don't know if I would take them over Boston. Like oh, I, that's Boston's – they're similar teams to me in the sense that, like, they've got a really good – their top five is solid. Boston probably has a little bit of a better sixth when you look at, uh, depending on if you want to call that person Al Horford or, or, or Derek White or whoever. Um, and in the playoffs, you, you're only playing, you know, eight guys usually. So that would be a really, really fun series if we ever get to that. Um, former Maverick Christoph Porzingis has had a pretty good season um, after mm -hmm. having a pretty good one last year in Washington, um, kind of joining up with the Celtics and, the, and uh, Tatum and Brown. But we'll see if we get that series. It, it doesn't always happen where you just kind of get – uh, uh, kind of the, the heavyweight matchup that you, you think you might get in March actually happening in June. But um, Matt Denver, yeah, if Denver were the four or five seed, I might be feel differently. But if they're at the top, it's going to be tough to beat them because, again, they've, they've proven they can do it. Yeah, it's funny because Denver, for a defending NBA champion, I don't know how they managed to do it, but sometimes it feels like they fly under the radar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Of, even with how good and how dominant, especially, you know, Jokic, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, it looks like he's on his way to – you know, a third NBA MVP, but at the same time, you know, and you mentioned Boston too. What concerns me about Boston is they're one of the best three point shooting teams in the NBA, right? How much more can they sustain that through a playoff run where shooting comes and goes and ebbs and flows, but they've got the Tatums and the Browns, as you mentioned with Horford and Porzingis right. as well. I just wonder how much longer that three point shooting, is it going to last throughout the course of a playoff run to eventually get themselves to an NBA championship. Yeah. I mean, that's a valid concern. Um, but the fact that it's lasted, you know, six months now is kind of like, <laughs> maybe that's just how it is. Um, yeah. but you're right. They've got all of those, all of those players that, that, that you mentioned and drew holiday, Horford, Porzingis, um, white Tatum Brown, they can all knock down even Peyton Pritchard. When you get deeper into their bench, they can all shoot the three. Well, um, and it's probably going to take, the majority of them, we're talking, you know, four or five of them being off for Boston to lose um, over the course of a series. Um, I mean, I always say uh, we've seen over the past couple of years that like centers have become more of a a mainstay in the league. When you look at Jokic and Embiid, um, you know, even going to someone like a like a Carl uh, Anthony Towns and a Rudy Gobert kind of Minnesota went all in on size a couple of years ago. Um, the Celtics still have two of like the most coveted things that people want in the NBA. They've got two dudes who are six, 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 seven, who can get to the rim, defend when they want to defend at a high level. They're quick. They're in their twenties, you know, uh, mid to mid to late twenties or even early to mid twenties, depending on how you want to look at it. I can't remember how old Tatum is right now, but he's not that old. Um, like going back to kind of what we talked about with, with the Mavericks, like that's a pretty good starting point to be at. If you got two guys like that, Tatum and Brown, um, they haven't won yet, but they've been in the finals. They've been in the uh, numerous conference finals. They're they're probably pretty hungry, um, and and you just gotta you assume that they've got that kind of fire inside them to like 
realize that this is their year with the way that they've played this season. Um, and knowing also when, if they're having an off night, that they can lean on someone like Drew Holiday, who has a title with the Milwaukee Bucks, um, Al Horford, who's been in the league, you know, for 15 plus years at this point, um, and maybe kind of take away uh, some of the pressure on them, uh, knowing that they've got a, a pretty good supporting cast. But I'm excited, man. It's going to be a, a fun playoffs. Yeah, I think it's, you know, people forget Jason Tatum. I think he's 25 years old. I feel like he's been yeah. in the league for 10 years at this right, point. Right, right, <laughs> Because right. the amount of success that Boston's had, haven't been able to cr- translate into a championship yet, but him and Jay LeBron feel like they've been around forever. And before we yeah. go to break, because the one team that I just I can't figure out, and maybe you can help me out here, what the hell is up with Milwaukee? Because <laughs> they lose to the Wizards on yeah. Tuesday. Damian Lillard misses the second game with a groin injury. But at times they look like the team that won a championship a couple of years ago. But then they look like the team that drops a game on the road to Washington, one of the worst in the league. And I just don't know if the Doc Rivers experience is the one that Giannis needs at this point because it's been very up and down for them since Doc Rivers has taken over for Adrian Griffin there. Yeah, it's it's interesting because like you really can't afford to – have a situation where you look at it and say like, okay, well, we're going to get a full off season workout and off season training program with a new coach and then come back and, and know that we're, we're where we need to be next season because, you know, number one, Damian Lillard is, is not getting as good as he's been at times. He's been a little off in others and he's, he's getting into his mid thirties. Chris Middleton has been banged up the past couple of years. Brooke Lopez um, is is also getting up there in age. Um, I say getting up there in age. He might be like my age, um, but for bas- for basketball, that's 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 almost ancient. Um, and then Giannis, you know, he he locked in with an extension recently, but um, you know he's he's gonna he's approaching thirty two. Like the window, I think as good as Milwaukee has been, we're kind of I had to pinpoint it like toward the second half of their window, and not necessarily at the first half. I don't think a Doc Rivers as a head coach, as successful as he's been and as disappointing as he's been in some other aspects, like that doesn't kind of just extend the window another two, three, four years. So um, I don't want to say it's like championship or bust for them because, um, you know, if they're healthy, they've still got, you know, they've got Giannis, they've got Dame, who's not going to fall off from, you know, top 10, 15 player to like 60th or 70th in the league. But um, they've got some issues and you would think that they would be smoothed out by now. But again, losing to, to Washington like that is, is not what Bucks fans probably want to see um, in in early April. Yeah, especially trying to get themselves, like you said, deep into the postseason where they've obviously tasted championship success. It's going to be right. a, a hell of a run toward the end of the regular season. Right. Let's take a quick break right here on the Gray Area Podcast and hear from today's sponsor of our video and our podcast, and let's hear from Aura. Today's video is brought to you by Aura. Do a Google search on your name and email address and see how much information comes up about you. I was devastated by the amount of information that I could be seeing searching my name and profile, and I knew then I needed to be protected for not just myself, but also for my family. Data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all out there. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, and other sensitive information. Aura also does so much more to protect me and my family from online threats that I can't see. It's really easy to set up, so I don't have to download several different apps to get things like antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more. I get everything at one affordable price. You may already have one of these tools already, but not having Aura is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Aura is always on, doing the hard work to protect me and my family so I can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. I value my privacy and I value yours. You can go to Aura.com slash Kevin Gray to start your two-week free trial. Please see the link in the description. Back here on the Gray Area Podcast. Thank you for hanging out with us through that quick break there. And thank you today's sponsor of our video and our podcast in Aura with Tyler Batiste, the managing editor of the Athletic NBA, talking all things NBA. And, of course, it's WrestleMania season as we get ready for the uh, the Super Bowl of professional wrestling. Tyler, like myself, is a massive pro wrestling fan. And with sports, 
there's always a level of entertainment that comes with watching, whether it be Major League Baseball, the NBA, the NFL, whatever the case may be. But it always feels like when you're watching professional wrestling, there's a certain element to it where while athletes in the major four pro sports, they always look at this particular weekend and they look and they say, you know what? It reminds them of how much they used to be professional wrestling fans or still wrestling fans. And the love and the joy that comes with that form of entertainment in terms of professional wrestling. And I think it's just a stark reminder that everyone, or I see a lot of folks are a kid at heart when they get to this time of the year. And this is always a great reminder of childhood, especially when you've watched professional wrestling in that way. Yeah, man. It's, 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 uh, I've seen like, you know, these, these posts online of, uh, you know, on, on TikTok or, or, uh, Instagram or whatever. It's like people saying that they, when they're at wrestling shows, it's not like the current version who's enjoying the show as much as it is like the eight, nine, 10 year old version. And that's the great thing about, I think professional wrestling is that there's something really for everyone. Like if you're, if you're a kid, you're, there's something in the show that you're going to enjoy. If you're an adult, there's maybe a different aspect that, that, that you're going to enjoy. And especially getting to this time of year, all of those things sort of come together. The, um, the comedy, the, the drama, the athletic ability, the, uh, you know, kind of influx from other places in the entertainment world, kind of all, um, you know, coming in the one um, at, at WrestleMania weekend and WrestleMania week. So, man, it's a, it's exciting, man. Just just talking about it in the abstract right now. I'm like, <laughs> let's go. Let's get to let's get to the weekend already, man. Right? Yeah, there there's a lot. And for folks who don't know, this is kind of a celebration of professional wrestling because not only do you have obviously with the WWE and what they do for WrestleMania, but you've got other promotions that do right. a lot of work around this weekend as well, whether it be ring of honor, if you're an AEW fan, you know, shout out to Okada, who of course is now with AEW and, <laughs> and the young bucks. I'm so interested in the idea. We'll get to the WWE in just a second, but I'm so interested in the Okada, uh, the heel run that he's going to be on. It, it appears obviously with, you know, with the young bucks, because, you know, if you look at the AEW roster, they've got a lot of talented individuals there. But I'm also looking at the roster thinking, why is 85-year-old Edge TNT champion? I'm not going to say anything <laughs> bad about Samoa Joe because I don't want him punching me in the face. Samoa yeah, Joe is yeah. fantastic. Love me some Samoa Joe. But I feel like with all the talent that's there in AEW, we've got a lot of older champions, if you will. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm ready for the Swerve Strickland uh, AEW title run at this point myself. What are your thoughts on what AEW is as a product and what they are still looking to kind of achieve when it comes to connecting with maybe the mainstream wrestling audience in that way? See, that's an interesting point. I'm glad you you ended it on that because, like, my, um, I have this conversation with my friends all the time who are who are also really big wrestling, uh, pro wrestling fans. They're probably – uh, they probably lean a lot more into uh, New Japan, AEW, sort of indie promotions um, than, than WWE, but they keep up with it all. And like the question I, I always kind of ask myself is like, does does AEW want to kind of garner that mainstream audience? You know, like um, the way it was launched, it was kind of started as an alternative to what WWE is. And, um, you know, I, I kind of use my dad, not only wrestling, but but like basketball and stuff too, like when I'm talking to my dad and if he knows a person, like just kind of the concept of what he knows, that's how I kind of view the quote unquote mainstream. And, um, you know, I've tried to, he watches WWE um, and I've tried to get him a little bit more in the AEW, but like, there's so many times that like, if you're not a hardcore wrestling fan, like you don't really know why a certain person is important when it's kind of presented on TV. It's kind of like, um, you have to kind of be aware, have a certain knowledge base to kind of get it. And eventually sometimes you're told, but it, I don't want to say it feels like alienating, but like if you're watching dynamite sometimes and this person shows up and you're like, okay, I'm supposed to know who this person is, but I don't know if you're, you know, a 60 something year old man, it kind of, you're kind of like turned off by that point. Uh -huh. um, but what they do is really great. The end ring product I think is second to none. Um, I think some of like the production um, tweaks that they've made recently over the past a uh, few months, you know, whether it's because of, you know, the, the higher ups suggesting it, whether it's because of new people working backstage, but um, it just looks a lot better. Um, you know, I think nowadays people always like get up in arms about ratings, but like there's, there's so many ways to kind of consume content that like the, the, the ratings that you're looking at from like traditional Nielsen or whatever, like they don't matter as much because mm -hmm. so many people watch things on, you know, social media or, 
Um, you know, they might record it on their, you know, certain library and then catch up on it later. And then it's like count it differently or whatever. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the fact that there are two viable promotions that you can watch on TV every week. Um, and I say two viable ones. There's also like TNAs there and there's other stuff. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, there's, there's, it's a, I know a lot of the pro wrestlers have said this, but like, it's a really good time to not only be a fan, but to probably be you know, in the business, because you can obviously use that for leverage. If you got a contract situation, you can, you know, kind of uh, almost kind of free agency in a sense. So um, but I'm happy that AEW is around man. it's giving people uh, an alternative. If you want, you know, a lot more faster paced in ring stuff and maybe not so much of the vignettes and all the backstage stuff that WWE does. And then then, then you've got you've got an alternative. If you got if, if you do enjoy that, the kind of entertainment television show aspect of it. Um, you've got a, a, a ch an option. So it's fun. Like it does nothing wrong with watching both. That's what I say. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The, like I, what I, you I, like I, and move on. Don't like what you don't like and, 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 you know, move on. Yeah. Yeah. And for example, like Brian Daniels, I'm enjoying the run that he's on as he's getting toward the end of his career. He's been a lot of fun to watch. I mean, it's good, as you mentioned, to have multiple promotions because there's a different genre that professional wrestling provides with each company that you may enjoy versus what you don't enjoy. And it's funny you brought up in terms of some of the storytelling, because the other day I watched the Roman Reigns documentary on A&E. And first of all, Paul Heyman is an incredible genius. Like, right. I mean. <laughs> we can have a whole conversation about Paul Heyman by That's himself. That's a whole other thing, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But what struck me most, and I had to be reminded of it watching it, because obviously he's at the focal point where he's going to be headlining, you know, in the main event for the eighth and ninth time. Shout out to two nights of WrestleMania so he can break that record now. Right, right. Um, But at the same time. I'm so glad it's two nights, though, man. Those, those six-hour shows were – was a bear <laughs> man listen when wrestle it was 2016 yeah. when it was in at&t and just be and speaking of roman reigns being there for the six seven hours and then waiting until him and triple h had their wwe championship match by the time i got back to my home and into my bed to go to sleep it had to be almost 1 30 in the morning man and like, i remember on, i remember too if if memory serves correctly like people had issues getting into the stadium i was i was yes. there and yes. I, I might have missed, I think I missed the first two pre-show matches because the ticket system wasn't working or maybe they were doing all mobile and nothing old school and like the, whatever system was down. Um, so it could have been even longer for me. And I was still like mm -hmm. at, toward the end being like, you know, they really could <laughs> just do this over two, two nights. <laughs> and, you know, obviously The Rock and, you know, seeing it appear like it, it was it was a great show. But at the same time, it's just way too long. But right. Look, they decided, hey, we're going to get you for this money twice. Night one and night two. It's, smart. So like, okay. it's a smart business decision. It, it's a great business decision. But at the same time, my, my pockets may not be that deep sometimes. So I got to pick and choose how the way I go away about this. But for, <laughs> for, for, for Roman Reigns, what I was reminded of is that we have never and I I'm interested in your take on this because. We have never seen the long form cinematic type of story be able to be carried for years at a time the way that the bloodline and Roman Reigns has been able to carry this. Now, we're, what, four years deep into all this when he came yeah. back to the company in August of 2020 to where we are now in April of 2024. And the storyline has evolved so much that I am hard pressed to find anyone who has carried this kind of story for this prolonged amount of time and yet still have so many layers that have allowed other characters to evolve and what that's meant for not just for them and that story but also for the company as well it's something that i don't think we've ever seen before when it comes to this kind of storytelling yeah i mean off the top of my head i can't think of anything that's that's kind of been uh this long and drawn out in a good way um, yes you know wcw had like the nwo which was it started out, you know, what was it, a a April or May when when Hall and Nash showed out showed up, and then, you know, Hogan and leading up to like that that Sting match, but that was still only like a year and a half, and and mm -hmm. after that, you know, the NWO had these different factions, and you know, got to like 20, 30 people at one time. It just wasn't, um, yes. yeah, that was that. We don't have to. That's a whole another podcast. But, uh huh. Uh huh. Um, you know, I think part of it is it, it's clear to me that they have sort of a they're not going week by week trying to like piece this together there's kind of a long-term idea of what they want it to be maybe toward the end that's not to say that they've had 
they haven't had missteps. Like, I don't think they've explained the like why Jimmy Us- Uso was like just all good with the tribal chief <laughs> uh again uh-huh. aspect of it well. Um, and they kind of started to. I don't know if you remember you remember when like he was sort of acting like Roman when he wasn't there, kind of like mm-hmm. the man in the microphone. I thought they were gonna go somewhere with that, but it didn't. And maybe that's still in the background and is going to come to light, you know, later this year or, or another year or two down the road. So I'm not saying it's been perfect, but it has kept people interested. And I think the fact that Roman Reigns hasn't is not on TV every week kind of keeps you wondering. It's twofold, right? It keeps you interested in the story, knowing that you're not just going to get an answer or another chapter or another paragraph next week. But it also... Um, and I think Triple H and uh, the folks in charge now have done a pretty good job of like telling longer term stories aside from like that. You know what I mean? And by that, mm-hmm. even just like a, you know, the the LA Knight AJ Styles thing yes. has been gone on since, you know, October when AJ Styles got injured. And then LA Knight, he thinks LA Knight took his his title, his title shot um, at that event. That's a six month story that at no point has felt like, oh, man, we're still doing this. Like, they've had a, Mm -hmm. at least to me, they've had a fatal four-way match. They've had some interactions. So I like the way that not just with the bloodline, they're kind of utilizing different aspects um, and and storytelling techniques that don't always involve, like, let's get in the ring and talk into a microphone for 10 minutes. Um, Yeah. So the fact that they've mixed it up. But, yeah, man, I can't think of the the fact that this Roman Reigns thing is still going on. And like you said, there's so many layers to be told with The Rock and Solo Sokoa and, um, the Usos and there's their legit family members who are wrestling in other promotions. Yes. That people are kind of like, wait, what if they show up? Like, <laughs> so man, there's so many layers to it. And I, uh, it, it's, it's fun to watch, man. Like it's a, it's a good, um, it, again, it's alternatives to kind of what the other promotions are. Mm-hmm. And it's good to like, I always tell friends who don't know wrestling is like, you know, try to figure out what sport they do know and then try to present it in that manner. Like, all right, you can be an auto racing fan, and there's F1, there's IndyCar, there's NASCAR. Like, the cars are faster here, but they may, you know, they're a bit, bit more, uh, you know, maybe better engines in this promotion or promotion, this company, uh, organization, or whatever you want to call it. Like, it's all under the same umbrella, but you can watch one and know that it looks completely different if you're watching one or the other. So, uh, it's fun, man. It's fun. So fun. Yeah. <laughs> to your point about the storytelling, because one of the things that I thought of as you were discussing that was the the logic. Like, don't you don't have to insult my intelligence by trying to tell a story. And the best example I can think of currently right now is the way that has been a lot of nuance in terms of the Bailey and EO Sky rivalry and how that's unfolded. And then the elements of Bianca Belair and Naomi being introduced. And one of the things that struck me recently is that, yeah, if I'm Bianca Belair, for example, who has gotten beat down by damage control for the last two plus years, why in the world should I feel any sympathy toward Bailey, who now has all of a sudden found religion and trying to go beat, EO Sky and Damage Control, why should I help them? But obviously Naomi helping out in terms of that process. But that to me is just like, that's a logical based story based on emotion and feelings that makes sense on why there would be nuance there instead of just automatically, hey, we support Bailey because she decided that, you know, she got turned on by Damage Control. Like, I think there's a lot of nuance that I think that is really refreshing for the storylines that they're telling now. Yeah, that that storyline, definitely. I like the fact that they sort of acknowledge that it, it makes sense because Naomi was away for a while. Like the, mm-hmm. the you know, the 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 Bailey that she knows most prominently is not the Bailey that we've seen over the past, you know, year and a half or so. Um, and then with the Drew McIntyre thing too, like yes, you know, kind of like <laughs> the seeds that were being planted there, and and you know, kind of him being uh, saying that hey, just because Jey Uso is kind of you know seeking redemption, you know, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't mean we should just forget about all the things he did when he was rolling with his brother and his cousin. And I like particularly those two stories, do do those two storylines because one has ended with a, you know, a heel turn where Drew McIntyre thinks he's speaking the truth. And the other (laughs) is, is Bianca Belair having not turned heel. Maybe it's coming, but at this point they've, they've kind of taken two different tracks with sort of the same kind of kernel of an idea, which, which, um, is really refreshing to see. Like, I, people always say, like, you know, fans will be like, baby faces are stupid. Like, that, I, yes. I'm glad that, like, 
we're seeing a little bit less of that uh, nowadays. It's just kind of stuff that that makes sense. And then if the crowd feels like they want to boo, great. If they feel like they want to cheer, that's a, that's another thing. But I mean, hell, going back to the long term storyline, that Bianca damage control, like <laughs> that's I I don't know if it's intentionally that long term, but man, that's that's been a what <laughs> almost that'll be two years in yeah uh, in in uh, August for SummerSlam. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think this might be the end of that. Well, I'm excited to see where where all those women involved in that match go after WrestleMania. Yeah. Before we finish up, but obviously getting our thoughts on you know the bloodline and what will happen nights one and two in terms of the main event. You mentioned Drew McIntyre because look, this version of Drew McIntyre I have thoroughly enjoyed. Whether it's the trolling on social media, his whole thing with CM Punk, I have just found that so entertaining, and it makes me wonder like. Man, where the hell has this Drew McIntyre yeah. been? Because this guy is highly entertaining. It's nuanced. It's funny. Like, he has been, to me, one of the MVPs of WrestleMania season because he has turned himself into just a highly enjoyable character with the amount of trolling and everything that he does when it comes to not just his own match, but reminding Seth, like, hey, dog, you might want to pay attention to yeah. me over here because while you over here hobnobbing with Cody and the bloodline and everything, you know, you might get your ass whooped over here in this WrestleMania World right. Heavyweight title match. So I, I've loved McIntyre's work throughout the course of the season, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the stuff he's been saying to Seth is, is um, it holds weight because if you're a fan, you realize that Drew McIntyre is a multi-time WWE champion. He's not just yes. someone who's kind of coming up um, on their first run. Like, those runs look different, but he's been on top. He's had that top title. Um, so him saying that, like, you got to worry about me, um, makes sense if you're somebody who's watched the product for a while. Um, and I also think all the stuff with CM Punk, it makes me all of that from what's been said online to on television, um, in interviews, it, it does, it's done one of my favorite things in wrestling, which makes me question how much of it is real. Like mm, every time it happens, lines, I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm like this, well, wait, does he actually hate Punk or, <laughs> or does he, or are they so good friends that they can have, fun with this and make it look real or is it just kind of half and half like every time he does something i'm kind of thinking you know makes me makes me wonder for for a minute which is the perfect place you want to be when you're when when you when you're watching professional wrestling kind of wondering what if what you're seeing is part of the show or if it is um you know kind of seeds of truth uh mm-hmm. being developed and 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 uh turned into something for television and, and social media and stuff so He's been great. One of the MVPs, like you said, it'll be fun to see what he does this weekend. Yeah. As we finish up today, obviously the biggest matches of the weekend in WrestleMania, aside from, by the way, real quick, uh, Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams. I cannot wait for that match. Right. I stand and deliver between those two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All <that's>... right, man. <laughs> My bad. That's a team impression. Shout out to Book. But- <laughs> That's a great Booker T impression. It's funny. I was just watching that the other day. I was like, yeah, man. I'm like, all right, oh, right man. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams. For those who don't know, watch NXT Stand and Deliver, that main event. Those two are going to tear the house down. I cannot wait to see that match. But obviously. Tear, tearing the house down in a non-title match. In a non-title in a, match. In the main yes. event. Like, it's, yes. That's a big stamp of approval on those, those athletes that. The WrestleMania show for that uh, that television show, the WrestleMania weekend event, uh, is going to be na- main evented by two uh, black guys who are not fighting for the championship. Like that yes. just shows you, you know, the level of uh, confidence that they have in, in those guys to go out there and uh, pardon the pun, but at stand and deliver, but go out there and deliver. Yeah, no, that's going to be incredible. Carmelo yeah. Hayes is a a man that's going to be on it. him and Trick. Honestly, generational talents. I can't like I said, can't wait for that one. Right. But man, listen, speaking of generational, the, the rock and what he has done since becoming the quote unquote final boss and having this to me, what feels like this kind of final run as the guy that we all know and love, whether he's a good guy, bad guy. And just the way that we've gotten to this point now with Cody Rose and Seth Rollins teaming up to take on Roman Reigns and the rock to determine whether or not this match for the universal championship between Rhodes and Reigns is going to be under bloodline rules what have your thoughts been on the entire storyline with the rock being infused into it the remaking of his entrance like it's just been incredible but what that informs you on how you think it's going to go down this weekend between these four men and obviously with Rhodes and reigns on sunday night for the uh, universal championship yeah i mean it's been 
a thrill to watch as a as a professional wrestling fan. It kind of goes back to what you mentioned all the way at the beginning of like when did you kind of first get into it? And obviously that Stone Cold era was um, you know, a large part of it was was the rock era as well. And and when he's on screen, it, it just reminds you of you could easily see why people thought he might be a star outside of professional wrestling 20 something years ago because of the charisma, the way that he can just um, you know, he has the crowd in the palm of his hand. And that's even more so now because of his stature outside of pro wrestling. People know who he is so much. Um, you know, I'm 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 curious about like what um we don't have enough time to get into all of this, but like what the plan was like January 1st mm -hmm. for WrestleMania as a whole. Like we're talking about like CM Punk's injury and whatnot. Like I would I would love to see like what the planned match order or script was at January 1st and how much it's been like, you know, crossed out and sharpie <laughs> over and white out and kind of rewritten since then. Um, but they've landed the plane or it looks like they're going to land the plane pretty well. Um, you know, the rock is in his fifties. I'm curious to see how much, how physical he actually gets, not only because of his, of his age, but also I'm sure he's probably got a movie or two to film at some point uh in the next couple of months and you don't mm -hmm. you know he he can't afford and other people who work on those those projects can't afford him to uh go out there and and, and you know break a leg or or um you know tear tear a bicep or something like that so i'm curious to see how physical he gets um i keep going back and forth about whether um roman or cody will win uh i feel like maybe earlier this week or last week, I thought it's going to be Roman again somehow. Mm. Now, the way that the past couple of Monday Night Raws have ended with just kind of the bloodline having like a pretty significant advantage makes me think that Cody might prevail on Sunday with it being bloodline rules, like with all of that going on. But I don't, what I don't see is like Cody having some sort of like six or seven month title reign. Like I, I'm curious about does he kind of get his WrestleMania moment and then here, here's how here's where my mind is. Let me give you let me okay. give you I think tag match Roman and Rock win. Mm -hmm. Seth is banged up and loses to Drew. Cody wins, and either that leads to you know Cody celebration at the end with a Seth attack or something happening where Cody doesn't have that title for too long. And we kind of get right back to the chase. You get the moment and then the chase begins again. I don't know where that mm -hmm. chase comes from. I like Seth Rollins. I I, I don't think I would kind of turn him uh, into a bad guy, but there's also in the back of my mind, when I watch it, you remember that Seth lost to Cody three times and, 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 you know, three months and, and yeah. just as a character is probably wants to get that win back. Uh, at some point. And if he loses his title to essentially help Cody get his, then like that kind of leaves him. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm curious to see what the things that start to develop next week on television too, in terms of sure. where they might be going with it. What, so yeah, I'm excited, man. What do, what do you think? I'm putting you on the spot. Roman or I, Cody? The, you know, the name that keeps coming to mind and I, I don't know how people feel about it, but I don't care because it's my show. <laughs> um, the name Damian Priest keeps coming to mind because uh, I'm watching yeah. him and Judgment Day, and I'm like, okay, at some point, Priest has got to. I think he's gonna. Ca I think he's going to cash it in, you know, on the World Heavyweight Champion, whomever that is. But I could see on on Sunday. I, I, for some reason, I feel like this is going to happen on Sunday because all okay. the buildup has been McIntyre has wanted to win this championship in front of, you know, 70,000 people, you know, get his redemption for what happened, you know, when he didn't win it at Clash of the Castle because the moment was taken. I could see that story continuing with him even winning the championship and then having that moment ripped away from him after all of the crap he's talked about with CM Punk and Seth Rollins, that Damian Priest be the one to cash it in on, you know, Drew McIntyre and win, you know, the championship. So I look, I don't know. It'll be it won't be heist of the century type of cash in the way that Seth Rollins did it to Roman Reigns and right. know, Brock Lesnar, you know, several years ago. But 
I feel like this might be Damian Priest's moment to finally be able to to get that World Heavyweight Championship because at some point, like we're coming up on almost a year now. Yeah. Like it's it's about time that he cashes it in. So I think McIntyre, I think he'll get the win, but then I think it'll have it, that moment ripped away from him uh, with the Judgment Day attack, and then all of a sudden Priest cashes in. I like uh, I, I like that. I agree. I agree that I don't think I don't think we get to the main event Sunday and have like Seth Rollins just be on cloud nine because he won. Like, yes. And that, that, and that'll lend into playing to everything that, that we think might happen that night, the night after on raw or whatever. But I like that priest idea. That's, that's, I didn't think about that, but yeah. 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 Like, so he, he's the name that keeps coming to mind, but obviously for the, the universal championship, look, if Cody Rhodes, like, I feel like he's been positioned. I mean, it's happening in Philadelphia. I feel like he's been positioned as the, kind of the Rocky of WrestleMania here. Underdog who's been beaten down. He ha- finally has a chance of redemption to be able to win it in Philadelphia. But I also think about Roman Reigns, and you remember quite well, too, that one time when he won the Royal Rumble and Philadelphia wasn't having it, and they sent The Rock out there to try and save the moment, and they was like, we see what you're doing here. We don't want this either because they wanted Daniel Bryan to continue what he – talking about finishing the story. They wanted right. Daniel Bryan to continue to do his thing, and I'm thinking about that from Roman Reigns' perspective that he gets to kind of go back to a moment of his career where it should have been a high for him, but yeah. he didn't have that moment, and I wonder how that plays into if he is able to get his own kind of quote-unquote redemption in his own mind – and still walk out, you know, universal champion. But I think Cody Rhodes, quote unquote, finishes the story and finally wins that championship because I don't know what we do exactly. if he loses again exactly. after winning the Royal Rumble and having gone through all of this and still not win the championship. That's my thought too, man. Like I, I don't know how you have him lose twice and have and still think you're going to have the crowd. It's amazing that the crowd has been behind them as much as they have because we know yes we know wrestling fans they can be a, a fickle bunch like like brian danielson used to say fickle or maybe that might be daniel, <laughs> yes. be daniel bryan technically but um it was almost like a a blessing in disguise that he got hurt and kind of people still wanted they they were want you know wanting him to come back and wanting him to kind of get back on that journey um mm-hmm. and it's amazing that He's been as hot as he's been since last WrestleMania. It's tough to do that for a whole nother year, potentially or however long. Um, but again, that's why that's why I think he he does it. But there's another layer to whether it be Seth. The story I really want to see. Speaking of storylines, we talk about really long term storylines. There's that Randy Orton factor, that legacy factor with Cody that hasn't hasn't even been touched since they've been back. Mm-hmm. And, and Randy Orton is such a good bad guy that at some point i feel like those two have to mix it up whether it involves the title or anything we'll see but um it's gonna be a fun weekend man i'm excited yeah it's gonna be incredible and this whole i want to see if this actually happens if rock really has been a double agent all this time and all of a sudden helps i can only i can't necessarily imagine because of how violent he's been with cody rose all of a sudden He yeah. turns around and helps him, but that would be another interesting part of this. If Rock has really just kind of been, you know, throwing up the, you know, whatever. And yeah, the, what is it? The, not the one, yeah. but the, the, yeah, L exactly. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So it should be a lot of fun this weekend. Can't wait for WrestleMania 40 this weekend in, uh, in Philadelphia. Tyler, tell the folks where they can find you. What you got going on, man? Yeah, man, um, a lot of good stuff over the athletic, um, not only NBA wise um, as we get prepared for the playoffs, but um, a ton of WrestleMania content this week by our uh, our resident wrestling fans. I know we've got some stuff up on Paul Heyman, uh, got some WrestleMania rankings coming later in the week. Also, another story on the the American Nightmare, as we've talked about Cody Rhodes coming. Um, and there's probably going to be some uh, a couple other things that can't come to mind right now that we're going to have on there. So please head to the athletic find our, our not only our wwe content but our, our nba content and uh and uh enjoy it that's what we do it for for the audience so have fun well this has been a lot of fun today on this conversation tyler i really appreciate you answering the call and helping me out today on the podcast and i look forward to your continued coverage of not just the nba but everything else for pro wrestling as well man and uh, hopefully you enjoy uh this weekend as much as the rest of us as pro wrestling fans will do so for sure man yeah absolutely man thanks for having me Appreciate you.
You got it. That is it for this episode of the Gray Area Podcast. Again, thank you to Tyler Battisti, managing at managing editor for the athletic i got it right uh for joining me here on the podcast today make sure you download and subscribe to the gray area wherever you get your podcast for free give it a five-star rating and write a review for it while you're there i'll be back on friday with my man reg at attila for reg fridays here talking all things nba and nca tournament and whatever else we want to talk about as well uh so join me on friday for the gray area then until then my name is kevin gray and i'll talk to you later peace